Coming up, more looks inside the top 10 of next year's NBA draft class from VJ Edgecombe to Liam McNeely. Prospects abound for Brooklyn as we keep rolling on what could be the future for the Nets. We dive in coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. He's Doug Norrie. I'm Adam Armbrecht. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We're 100% free on all those great platforms and let you know that now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get three weeks of free trial on NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started today. And Doug... It just never ends. Honestly, I think the Nets could pick anywhere from seven, eight, nine, ten. Who even cares? Let's get some more wins this year because the prospects are too deep. VJ Edgecombe first up. Buddy, let's not joke around that. We don't want to. <laughs> this is not what we signed up for. We, <laughs> we didn't sign up for the W's. You and I are mentally prepared to get ourselves into the top five, hopefully top three, hopefully top one of the NBA draft going into 2025. Uh, but uh, all jokes aside, this is an incredibly deep draft. This is why the Nets are positioned to tank this season as opposed to last season. Let's say uh, they were helped along with the Mikhail Bridges thing. But overall, this draft has many guys who would have been the number one pick in this year's draft, <laughs> in this previous draft. I mean, we can go down to five, maybe even further as we go. I would say almost I feel very confident that one through five in this draft would have gone easily number one. VJ Edgecombe sits in that group as well. A lot to talk about with him um, in terms of like where he fits in, in the top five and then overall sort of like his game. But I mean, what were your thoughts when you saw some of his stuff? Because it's interesting where he lands compared to the other guys, but it's also interesting. It's interesting both ways, I think. I, I like, yeah, I, the fun part of look, about looking at these prospects, and you said it right, there's so many guys when you go, like, put them in their own draft class a different year, and you're having right. a different conversation. VJ Edgecombe, I mean, guard, 6'5", 6'6", wingspan, 180 pounds, but, like, the shoulders to put on some some muscle as he gets to the NBA. Going to be almost 20 years old at the time of the draft. He's fun, though. Like, he is a fun watch when you look at some of the highlights of him. He has, it's not just like the quickness or getting downhill and going at the basket. We'll talk about the outside game, the defensive end, all, all the skill sets. But in terms of, I was thinking about it when we had the conversation looking at Traore, where you go, oh, wow, this guy, the speed jumps off the page at you. Yeah. There's something about Edgecomb that jumps off the page at you just in terms of style. Like this guy is winning on style points when it comes to some of the plays that you see him, especially taking guys off the dribble, working into the paint and getting some really impressive looks at the basket. Yeah, and I mean, easily can start there with the athleticism, right? The mm -hmm. athleticism just completely pops off the off the screen. Um, he ha he's an, an high, a high riser compared to like almost no one else in the class. I mean, like Ace can get up too, for sure. So maybe like Ace Bailey is in that group also, just in terms of like fast switch, get up and over the rim. Absolutely. It looks, looks different for a smaller guy who's elevating the way that edge cone. Totally. Is. Yeah. Totally. And this is where like he came in over the summer when they were doing um, national team warm up stuff because he was playing with the Bahamas group and he was already doing highlight real stuff when they were sort of t uh, tuning up for the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and you know, you see him being able to play against some other like higher level talent with that group when hit within, when it comes to VJ Edgecombe, you know, what I always like to see right away is guys who, and we talk about this a lot, guys who are dialed in on defense, even at a younger age, because that's going to be something that plays later. And I think we're seeing this more and more with these groups of guys that are coming in that they're just like, oh yeah, defense matters too. I it can't just yeah. be a highlight reel on the offensive end. It has to matter on defense. They're getting trained up early on this. They know that like their scouting tapes are going to be really picked apart. I think that's important. Like there's just a wealth of scouting and not saying like it's, this is to VJ Edgecombe specifically. I just think in general across the board, there's the idea now that your game tape is going to get picked apart by countless content creators out there and draft analysts mm -hmm. and people. And you just can't take plays off. 
Like, like, and I think we see this more and more with, with different guys. So again, not a VJ Edgecombe thing. Like I, that sounds like it's a, I'm saying like, that's why he, he plays defense. I think we've just seen it more just in terms of like looking at draft stuff, but Edgecombe already is kind of there. Like he has great defensive instincts. Yeah. That's into lanes. He can get into the body of guys. He can get out on, and he uses the defense to get out into transition where he's just easily like one of the fastest guys on the court. That part is really, really exciting. It's why I think when he goes to Baylor this year, yeah, even if you put aside some of like the holes in his game, he's gonna be like a highlight real guy. Like we're gonna see highlight real stuff from him at Baylor because like that is just easy. That's like it probably is his best skill right now, which is like defense slash overall athleticism. Yeah, that shot blocking ability that he that he shows on some of these plays that you go and you watch him specifically even on guys, you know, not even so much directly in and around the basket, but moving away from the basket and towards the perimeter takes that timing, that athleticism to be able to close the gap a little bit and, and somewhat impressive given the six, six wingspan. Like you would think sometimes we talk about guys that have that six, five frame and then six, eight wingspan. And that's always what ends up jumping out when you try to get into those defensive assignments. But to your point about getting picked apart a little bit, not edge comb, but everybody in general. Because so many guys obviously come out with a high offensive baseline or can do X, Y, and Z, and you look at those three, four categories and you go, yeah, this guy's amazing, incredible. But then you're going to turn, whether it's the defensive end or reverse it, and you're going to say, is that perimeter shot going to come around for player X? Are we going to see the three-point shooting? Are the turnovers going to drop? Like all those little elements in a draft cast like this, I think it almost becomes it probably becomes almost comical at a certain point because you start dissecting players that, as we're saying, are so good and are such a high yeah. talent level that you're actually trying to find a way to, to knock players that in, in a lot of other years, you you wouldn't even worry about some of these other details that you get into in a class like this. Yeah, it's hilarious. And Edgecombe like falls into that category, right? Because like if you looked at the athleticism, if you looked at just the overall instincts, at least on the defensive end, and, and I think there's going to be stuff that comes around the offensive end, he as compared to some of the guys that were in this year's draft class, like he just, it wouldn't even be close. I, I don't think, right? Like it just wouldn't even be close. And so sometimes you just get victim of circumstance with just how old you are, honestly. Like you just, you, you know, you get born into a certain year and you get leave high school in a certain year and you, or, you know, or overseas stuff. Um, and you just, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, oh, Victor Wembanyama's in my draft class. Awesome. <laughs> right? I guess I won't be going number one. All right. <laughs> or it's like, oh, Zach Rijache was Zach Rijache was like the number one guy. Why couldn't I have just been born a year earlier? And I would have just been the number one overall pick. It's splitting hairs to some degree. I was thinking about that, that like the whole time I've been watching Edgecombe stuff, though, is because like, again, what you want to see from this level of guy is the ability to just like already stand head and shoulders above sort of like everyone else that he's been putting into different groups with. And yeah. he played against Cooper flag. He's played against a lot of these other guys. He was Gatorade player of the year. Like he is just already in that sort of elite class. And I would put, and I think that's why when we look at this draft and I want to get a little bit more into edge combs, like sort of game here in a second. But when we look at this draft class, I do think there's a drop off here. Like at this point at five. And I actually am. I, I don't know about you. Maybe we can get to the end of the episode. I mean, certain groups have one through five as Cooper Flag, Ace Bailey, Dylan Harper, Nolan Trory, and then VJ Ashcombe. I'm wondering if you agree with that top five overall as like a grouping and if like, or if you think there's a tier here, but when it comes to Edgecombe, mm -hmm. like he's just in that, he's just so clearly in that class of dude with pieces of his game that have significant room for growth in a, yeah. in a really good way. Coming up here in a second, we'll continue the conversation, not only on Edgecombe, but obviously taking a look at Liam McNeely as well, answering the questions. Is this the way the top five group should be? Is that a tier unto itself? We'll continue the conversation on these future prospects coming up here in just one moment. All right. Talk about our friends over at FanDuel. Look, you heard us talk a lot about FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. We got something a little different for you now. Through September 22nd, so got three weeks, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. And with YouTube TV base plan, you're going to be able to watch every single regular season a Sunday afternoon out of market game. That's important. All you need is a Google account. We've all got one of those. And a current form of payment. You got one of those, too can cancel anytime just visit fanduel.com and download america's number one sports book 
All right, as we continue today's Locked On Nets episode, talking about obviously future prospects, VJ Edgecombe, we'll get to Liam McNeely here in a minute. And then also the, the question that Doug was posing there, what is the hierarchy of what is a very deep draft class? Is there a clear drop off even inside of the lottery, even inside of the top 10, maybe inside of the top five or six players? But just to your point on uh, VJ Edgecombe, we talk about, you mentioned that the Olympic qualifiers, the average 16 and a half, five and a half rebounds and 3.8 assists over that run. So it's, you know, these are things to me, it's always like when you see a uh, Cooper flag and he plays against some of the NBA guys for a couple of practice sessions, anything that moves the needle and expands who you're playing against and what that looks like and, and opens up the sample size is only going to confirm or deny or help hype up a player. So I think uh, Edgecombe did a great job for himself in that regard. Offensively, I think if we want, if we want to talk about areas that he does need to improve, he profiles as a guard with some potential point guard ability, but then the ball handling comes in, in, into effect there when you talk about the difference between being on ball, shot creator, making for yourself versus decision making, setting up others and how the offense can flow through you as much as flow from you, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think I don't think he's a point guard for sure. Yeah. So I think I would stop there. I think he's like an off ball sort of combo guard slash like low end three that can play they can defend up because his defensive skills are, yeah. are are pretty are pretty good and the athleticism is already there. In sh in terms of shooting, like the form looks really good. It was like not incredibly consistent, but he showed deep range at times and the willingness to pull up, especially like sort of sometimes some early pulls in the shot clock, which is I, I think a overall pretty good thing. His catch and shoot stuff like wasn't super instinctual, so he didn't like he would pass up shots at times. Yeah, that's something I think will end up coming around. Maybe the college game helps a little bit of that although college game isn't like totally a you know a shoot quick you know just quick shot like quick three point kind of game in general so we'll see if like that's able to come around that's the part of his game that will have to get better just like the more quick the, the quicker decisions on offense and then being able to feel really really comfortable with the shot cuz like i said i don't see him as a, a as a on ball guard mm -hmm. but his on ball creation has room for improvement especially if he feels, I mean, there's like not much of a mid range game at all. I don't think that's like a huge deal, but it kind of matters a little bit at six, five. Um, Cause he's just not going to be able to like, you need to be able to be a little more of a three level scorer probably to have to really, really expand the game. But if you watch his shot, the shot, like you could imagine the shot looking, getting a lot, like leading to some really good returns yeah. overall. It's just, I, I don't know. If it's completely there yet, but I do think there's like maybe a slight confidence issue when it comes to the shooting. But I think that's actually something that could easily be corrected like really quickly with just like a, a green light and a coaching scheme that says, hey, like you're going to be the number one scorer. Just take some shots here. Let's go. Yeah, and it's interesting because on the offensive end, when we talk about guys, you know, a buck 80, so he's going to need to put on some weight. But because he's so athletic, you, you can sometimes overlook things like that. You think about players at the NBA that are so athletic and so quick and so decisive offensively that you can navigate the lane. You can beat your defenders. You can get to the rim. But then you talk about, well, what if you need to settle down into those pockets in the mid-range game to getting shots from the elbow, et cetera. The difference maybe with Edgecombe in terms of, of looking at him as a prospect is because the defensive value is so high with him already coming in the door, like this is the balancing act. Sometimes you come in, we always, I relate it back to the Nets, you always say, Cam Thomas, well, this dude's a pure scorer, he's going to come in, watch him cook. It's so good, you don't worry about the defense until you get to the NBA level and you start thinking about rotations and combinations of players. And you say, okay, how are we going to, when we need to, hide a player like this on that end? As long as Edgecombe can show some of that shooting touch and some of that form, if the confidence can come around away from the basket offensively, then I think you have the two-way two talent that you want to see. But there are going to be times probably at the NBA level when for all the athleticism, as we always say, like there's also guys that are just as athletic, more athletic than you and bigger than you and stronger than you. Are you going to be able to find other ways to be productive offensively if you get shut down for runs? That's probably the question or hurdle that you'd love to see get confirmed over the course of a year at Baylor this upcoming season. And I think, and again, I think he's the kind of guy that's going to get there. Like I love the motor. Um, I'm yeah, always really, really, like, really such a stupid intangible, but like he has, he has the right, like edge to the way that he plays on the offensive end. Like, you know, totally, me, totally. My ball, like my ball. I, I go make plays, you know, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Way. And I think like, that's really, that's really important. And, and look, we're really splitting hairs when it comes to some of these guys for sure. Um, just because of like, just, you know, it, it, at this point, at this, but at this point at like, when you're talking about like number one lottery kind of guys, you're looking for like, how many boxes do they check? 
And if they get the more they check, then there's the higher they're going to go. And then there's always going to be, and if look, if he checked every box, he'd be the number one pick, right? Like yeah. this, it's not, these guys all fall into this range of sort of like needing to probably develop some part of his game. But I, what I'm most, what I want to see most is that like the, especially from the tape that like, Oh, can you imagine it getting there? Cause we've seen guys too. It's like, Hey, you know, a good example of this would be, I mean, to some degree, Traore was like this where it's like, I'm wondering why the sh- why there isn't just more shooting, right? Like why there isn't like why there isn't more shooting here, and it's a little concerning. Um, and even when it does go up, is like is it totally perfect? I- I'm not really sure. I just want to see that there's like a willingness, and then that you could what you see on tape, you could expand it into like sort of a higher level, a higher level part of your game. And this is even backing out like the highlight real stuff that Edgecomb already has. So I think that. I mean, before we even get to McNeely here, because mm-hmm. we'll just talk briefly about him at the end, let's just go through it. Like, when you look at this top five, we talked about Cooper Flag, we talked about Ace Bailey, we talked Harper, Nolan Traore, and now VJ Edgecombe, which is, I, w- I would say, pretty solidly consensus top five right now. Maybe the order switches around. Yeah. Would you keep it in that same order, or would you switch it around now that we've done, like, sort of deeper dives on all these guys? I th- Yeah, I mean, the top three... That's so interesting. Yeah, the top three is fine. Would I put Edgecomb up over Traore? Probably, probably not. I think I would stick with Traore because of it, when you look at what his game is and saying playing at the pure point guard and creating for others. And you mentioned it's like he's almost, he's one of the guys. You go, why not more shooting? Like why, why why not more volume? I'd probably keep it there like that for now. And then you're talking about him behind them. It's only you know Hugo Gonzalez. We looked at Trey Johnson. I I think the five i'm comfortable with would you put edgecomb over Traore at this point yeah i would yeah i would because I, like I, I think that like just the athleticism like plays higher and i think the shooting to me projects better and i think that i like, like for instance i think actually Traore. if i had to pick if i had to start tomorrow mm-hmm. like if i had to start if, if i had to play an nba game tomorrow I would take Traore. Traore, right. Yeah 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 like yeah. and i think that like I, but if i had to play with him four years and I had four years to kind of figure out what was going to happen. I would take Edgecomb, and I think that's the, the more of the game that the Nets need to yeah. be playing right now is like not what happens to, and it's not a knock on Trey necessarily, but I just think like this, like Edgecomb's ceiling is so much higher. It's so high. Like if these other pieces of his game, I think he has higher bust potential too, though. Like so, I think that like you when I case, look through those right when you that? get away from the top one, two, three guys, you go, hey. But I'll take the guy with maybe the higher ceiling, even if there's some potential it doesn't get there on a higher level than a I think career. Edgecomb has the highest bust potential of the top five. I think he has a chance to get to like where Ace Bailey is too. Probably not quite because of the size, but like I think he could easily be higher than these are two. But if I had a bet, if I had a bet floor, I would not, t- I would take him fifth or maybe sixth. But right. like, um, <laughs> then you have a different conversation for for, for floor. But to your yeah, point, yeah. But, but, but ceiling, I, I you have to put him up higher. So I would rank him above Trevor here. I would yeah, go. Yeah, I would go. Flag Bailey, Dylan Harper, then a drop off, then yeah. Edgecomb, then Trevor. Yeah, yeah. So top th- top three tier. A little bit of a gap here. Well, no, sorry, sorry. It's it's flag small drop off Bailey big drop off drop off uh, Harper <laughs> small drop off and then those are, yeah that's that's how I'd rank it and, and, and just as you were saying I think Traore you would say um inside of that top five group that we're talking about would also and I'd probably agree with it even though I might have him ahead of ahead of Edgecombe right now I would say oh he might have the low I almost guarantee I would say he has the lowest ceiling of that group as well maybe a higher floor but a lower ceiling in terms of overall where you think his game is going to grow. Coming up here in a second, said we're going to get to Liam McNeely. And where does he fit? How much is there a drop-off now when we get into that Hugo Gonzalez and we get into the Liam McNeely's and the Trey Johnson's of the world? We'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode coming up here in just one moment. We also, of course, remind you as we're watching Locked on Nets. Thanks for making us your first listen of the day. We greatly appreciate it. Second listen, why don't you go ahead and look at Locked On NBA. You know it's all that daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less, just like ordering your favorite pizza. No one keeps you as informed or entertained as Locked On NBA. It's available on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team. Oh, it's every single day. Liam McNeely. Now, I feel bad because we're having this conversation about tears and guys that are clearly here and 
Liam McNeely to me is a is a step down from from who we just spoke about in VJ Edgecombe. I wouldn't put him up in that same group. But what's your initial take when you look at VJ Edgecombe, Edgecombe in his game? Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> when you look at Liam McNeely in his game. Yeah, so he was an interesting guy. Like he switched programs a lot. He ended up at Montverde with with play with Cooper Flag, but like. I think the knock on him a little bit is that like, it's been all a little bit all over the place at like sort of where he's going and like where he's committed to, because I am pretty sure he committed to Indiana and then switched to UConn. He went to three different high schools. Like he's kind of been all over the place. Uh, and just in terms of his the development track, I, I, you know, I tried to figure this out, but it seemed like that was like knocking him a little bit because he's huge. He's six, eight and he yeah. has range too. Like if you, yeah. he's six, eight with size that can put on, you know, not super fast, but, can definitely stretch the floor. Definitely seems like he has instincts for the game. Um, but it's almost like no one ever got like super long looks at him in any current situation. If, if I'm wrong about that, like, please let me know in the comments. He's a guy where I do wonder, like, so when we talk about the parts where who could end up higher on the list than they are now, right? So like, let's say McNeely's in that nine ten range right now. A year at UConn this year, could I see him creep to the top six, top five? I think for sure. For sure. He's got the size, but he doesn't play like a 6'8 guy. Like he can stretch the floor. He can play make a little bit. Like, um, and look, this looks really, really comfortable. Looks like he's kind of got a, like a chip on his shoulder, maybe an attitude too. I don't know if it's like the right kind of attitude, but, um, <laughs> right. it, like it, but it, he definitely feels like he has that to him. I think overall, with like maybe some stability and then like, just like, you know, probably being put into like the college game a little bit. Is there a part where he could climb? I think for sure. I think he could fall too, but I think like he, if I had to pick right now, if I thought he was going to be higher or lower than like, let's say nine overall right now, I would bet higher. Like I would take him right now over my watch. It'd be close on Hugo Gonzalez with me just because I see him. Especially over, if the over shooting trade, range is there. Uh, n- well, that one's closer. But, yeah. like, for sure over, come on. Um, yeah. And then maybe over Hugo Gonzalez, too. Like, I I just think that his game's going to translate really well. And he already does some things that you can see happening at the NBA level, specifically stretching the floor with a guy with, like, pretty big size. Yeah, it's interesting, man. Because, I mean, I, I, I said it there as we're, we're coming up with these kind of tiers and where guys fit. And it is, I mean, you mentioned it there. He is not doing anything at a fast pace. But now, you know, there's 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 plenty of examples that guys at the highest level. And by the way, please, point stop. This is not a comparison. But when you watch, you know, you're watching Dallas and you're watching Luka, it's like, or when you're watching, you know, Nick, Nikola Jokic, these are the best of the best. When these guys are playing, you go, well, they just kind of play at their pace. And that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, that's not what we're talking about Liam McNeely being capable of doing as he goes to the NBA. But there's something about watching some of his hot, some of his tape where you go, okay, it all looks good, but is this going to be quick enough at the NBA level? Yeah. Or is this going to look a little bit clunky at the NBA level when you try to do what, what feels a little bit like a methodical spin move into the lane and there's just a defender standing there in front of you and it's a little bit of point blank. Now, the size is impressive. And there is some defensive versatility there on the offensive end. He's looked good in some like you know D- D- o- DHOs, excuse me, and getting opportunities for others. He had forty five percent shooting, as you mentioned, junior year at uh, Mount Verde, Mont Verde. So there's these things inside of it that maybe you're right. Oh, at, at UConn for a year, all of a sudden, and you just see him consistently in the same place in a system that it starts to elevate what his game is overall. But if I had to call it right now, I'd probably say, because he's eight on Tankathon, I'd sit him right there. I wouldn't drop him any lower, but he probably is a guy that has a lot to gain by showcasing a consistent year of all these elements that speak to a player that could be a high impact with size and with range. And also, (laughs) maybe, maybe down to the attitude, could be a guy who plays with more of a chip than his skill level or ability dictates he should. I don't know. He's interesting. He's a really interesting player to watch this year. One thing I thought was hilarious when I was watching his tape was I was like, I had to go back and look at his age because he looks so much older than everybody. Like when he was like the Monverdi, the Monverdi stuff specifically, like he's just, he's just built like now, like has like kind of like NBA close to NBA body now. And I was like, hold on a second. Is this like birth certificate time? Like, where are we with like over, like where he is with his age? Um, But he is the same. He's like in the same age grouping as everyone else, but he just kind of like looked a little bit older than everyone. So it definitely threw me off a little bit. It definitely threw me off. He's a guy 
Look, among the many Seven guys team, that we're going to make an impact in the NBA when I get there in the future. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Active, <laughs> actively shaving my mustache mid mid third quarter of high yeah, school. Yeah, as a, as a thirteen year old. Yeah, like as a as a <laughs> as a twelve year old, just like you know, breaking out to get rid of the five o'clock shadow. Need some beers after the game. I mean, whatever. It's whatever. Yeah. So. Anyway, I think he's a good example, again, of like what the question marks around this draft class are and where we're going to see. I mean, this is such an exciting draft class because the fact that we're talking, we're going this deep on guys already who would have rated just a lot higher in different groups. Um, I think that like we're just, again, I, the Nets, we, we begged for it for a year, basically, yeah. with, for the Nets to reset. Uh, we begged for it with like, and, and, kudos to us i mean we were on this i'm telling you right now we were on this earlier than any other nets fan for sure any other nets content creator not close not close about how how soon we pivoted to the the nets have to do this they have to reset took a bunch of crap for it in all different places and yeah. guess what shock you everyone got on board with it <laughs> uh, right <laughs> hate to Welcome shock to everyone drink. here hate to always always early to the party and that's fine but like this is one of the reasons, and this is even before we had a full, full, full understanding of this draft class. We knew Cooper Flag, we knew Ace yeah. Bailey, like we knew these guys to some degree, Harper, and then like you know the rest of the group. We knew who these guys were, and we understood that like, hey, like the consensus is that this draft is going to be really, really strong. And if the Nets were going, this would be it'd be nice to get back in here, right? But this is just such confirmation. Like it's just such confirmation looking at these guys that the Nets did the right thing. And next year might even be this just as good. Uh, like, and so there, cause there's a whole nother group of guys. I mean, we're not going to get into 2026 draft coverage yet because even we're not that psychotic, you know, but I mean, like, this is exactly the reason that the Nets can get paid off for making this switch now. Yeah. And it gives you the ability to look at these guys so in depth because the talent is real. If we had done this in last year's draft class, it would have been a lot different. It would have felt a lot harder and the prospects would have looked. It, it was hard. Harder. It was hard in that draft the yeah. day before the draft, right? Like the day right. before the draft, no one really kind of knew. I mean, they kind of knew, but no one felt great about it. Yeah. Like no one felt amazing about it. And th this draft is just such a different animal. And we still got to talk about the twenties too. And all, and the other three picks and what the Brooklyn chooses to do with those. So still more prospects that we can get into here as we will continue all week long. Go ahead. All right, buddy. We're gonna get out of here. Um, uh, we might hit one more. Nah, I think we'll be done for the draft stuff. We'll we'll hit some where the Nets are. Nets made some other uh, some other moves. We'll kind of just take stock uh, for the rest of this week about where the Nets stand right now. It's still a Come very I mean, season's coming, baby. Come on now. We're I'll getting tell there. you one thing. It's funny. I mean, everyone's still on the team. I'll tell you that right now. Like everyone, that's uh, update. Everyone's still on the team. No one got traded, so I don't know what they're gonna do. I mean, we'll take it three weeks later after we look at this. Like take another run at the minutes. It has not really uh, crystallized itself that much. So we'll get into that. We'll get into where the Nets stand kind of um, heading into September here. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe to YouTube as well. Uh, yes, my good man. I'll have the milk steak boiled over hard and your finest jelly beans raw. Why that is Charlie Kelly. Uh, one of the all-time great poets. Mm. We're back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball. Basketball.